Welcome to today's KM World webinar, brought to you by Inodata and Lucy. I'm Mary D. Ojala, Conference Program Director, Information Today, Inc. I will be the moderator for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled, Tag, You're It, Automating Data Discovery. Now, before we get started, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the submit button. We will try to get to as many questions as possible, but if your question has not been selected during the show, you will receive an email response to it within a few days. Plus, all viewers will be entered to win a $100 Amazon gift card just for viewing today's webinar. And now to introduce our speakers for today, Rahul Singhal, Chief Product and Marketing Officer in Adata, Scott Littman, Founder and Managing Partner, Lucy. And now let me pass the event over to Scott Littman, Founder and Managing Partner, Lucy. Go ahead, Scott. Excellent. Thank you very much and uh, very excited for today's event. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, so Scott Littman, co-founder of Lucy. Uh, I've spent the last 20 some years as an entrepreneur in uh, technology and technology services. I've had the good fortune uh, to work with over 20% of the Fortune 500 in that time, uh, typically working on new technology initiatives. The, you know, what's next, what's exciting. Uh, I've been fortunate to be uh, an ENY Entrepreneur of the Year. I've built Inc. 500 companies and over the last six years, uh, we have been um, uh, bringing Lucy to market. And uh, with that, uh, Raul, if you can give a brief intro for yourself as well. Sure, thanks, Scott. Um, uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, Rahul Singhal, I'm the Chief Product and Marketing Officer for Inadata. Um, we'll talk about Inadata later. My background, i am um, been in the technology industry and AI industry for the last 25 years. I spent majority of my career at IBM. I uh, was fortunate enough to be part of IBM Watson uh, in 2013 when it was just starting out and AI was beginning. I led the Watson platform for four years, ended up uh, actually working with Scott at Lucy. And then for the last four years, we've been uh, taking, uh, making the promise of AI uh, live for Inadata. Uh, excellent. Thank you. And it is always good to see you. So just very briefly i'm going to spend 90 seconds to just say a little bit about our product and what we do because it provides some a frame of reference for um the problems we work on every day and why this area of uh metadata uh and data discovery is so important to us so the problem we're out to solve in the marketplace is that companies are loaded with data uh, the bigger the company the more data and the harder it is for any one individual to find what they need right now. And the two challenges we see is that, uh, number one, for people that are trying to find things in typical corporate environments like a SharePoint, uh, it can be a very time consuming task uh, if you don't already know where it is. You know, To find uh, the work of, of peers and subject matter experts and predecessors or from other departments, it's you know where do I search, how do I search, all of that. The other problem we've been out to address is that for many people, they don't even bother trying. Uh, they just go to Teams, Slack, or some messaging app and start sending messages around saying, you know, uh, at Scott, at Raul, at Mary D, can somebody tell me where this study is, where this report is, where this document is, where this webinar is? Uh, and they hope that, uh, you know, uh, that the world will speak back to them, and give them the answer. Uh, neither, neither one of these things are very efficient. And so we built Lucy to be an answer engine. And it's Lucy's job to find the right answer for the right person at the right time. Now, Raul, if you can just give us a moment to share a little bit about what Inodata uh, does, that would be great as well. Great, um, thanks, Scott. So we uh, at Inodata, our mission is to deliver the promise of AI to the world's most prestigious companies. And um, if we, how we do it, uh, we are, uh, we've been in the business for 30 plus years. We have 4,000 global experts around the world. We serve 1,400 plus customers like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, uh, and the likes. And um, one of the biggest things, uh, the hurdles in AI tends to be 
uh, data, right? Um, our core expertise is around taking unstructured data and structuring that data by using our global teams and AI ML techniques to create structured data that could be fed to a machine that allows you to build very good pristine models. Um, and, um, and we'll talk about how we've been helping lots of customers create custom uh, metadata, uh, extracting custom metadata and building custom models by using our uh, AI ML techniques. Uh, very cool. And I did not know that you guys are servicing the University of Minnesota, my alma mater. So uh, at some point, we'll have to catch up on that. All right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so here's a quote that I saw uh, from Deep Analysis the other day. They do a great job of covering the space of knowledge management. And they said, nobody likes enterprise search. Everybody wants it to work like Google. And I thought, you know, that's really true. I mean, it's, it's, we all, you know, we're used to having the whole universe delivered to us. Um, and Google is amazing in its ability to search public content and deliver what a user wants. Um, but, uh, but Google has a really interesting advantage uh, when it comes to all of this. And that is that public websites are designed to be searched. There are armies of specialists uh, you know, third party vendors and consultants, uh, companies have uh, budgets and significant, significant labor they put towards the challenge of um, search engine optimization so that content can easily be found. Content is designed from the beginning to scream, pick me, pick me, uh, and to be found. But for your internal content, uh, it's not true at all. You know, that deck that you worked on earlier today or will work on this afternoon, uh, you know, have you spent a moment thinking about writing the content for internal searchability? You know, have you ever tagged the individual pages of a document so that they can be found by others later? Um, either nobody or almost nobody's ever done that. And, you know, why would they? Uh, it's too much work and it just wouldn't be worth it. And so ultimately, you know, what we want is Google, but what we get is this. Uh, you know, we search typically in environments, you know, in large corporations, it's going to be, you know, SharePoint or Teams or OneDrive for business, or, you know, maybe people are using Box or Ignite or other, uh, you know, uh, systems. But, you know, so most searches end up being by keyword or file name. And then we get a giant list of documents. You know, in this one, you know, it's, um, you know, it's 1,458 results. Uh, you know, but even if you just get dozens of documents or hundreds of documents, it still can be overwhelming because what you're really doing is you're searching in the hope of finding that quote, that passage, that statistic, that paragraph, that uh, infographic uh, that's ultimately on page 63 of a 110 page document. Um, but it's just one of the documents out of these 1,458. And so... why this matters is that the act of searching is a very low value act. Uh, there's no, you know, if I have a great three hours of looking for all kinds of information to go into my strategic deck, to my proposal, um, working on the, you know, the, the deck for the boss or the leadership team, the act of searching um, is effectively valueless. It's time consuming, but it doesn't add value. It's what happens once I find the information. Uh, once I have the insights, once I have the results, once I have the information, once I have what my customer needs, whatever it is I'm looking for. So the values in what I found, not in the time spent getting there. And the reality is it's really time consuming. And so if we you know, look at the, the right side here, and this is a very simplistic model, but if we think across you know, a typical 1,000 employees, if we're spending a couple of hours every week searching for information, um, the amount of time in that low value task is immense. And, you know, and this is, you know, if we were to say if there's two hours per week per person on average for a $75,000 a year employee, um, you know, that's millions of dollars of waste in an organization. And a lot of the organizations that are, you know, listening are a lot bigger than a thousand employees. And so this stuff really adds up and it ends up being a very important problem. So how do we make this better? So the first thing we think about is that um, 
is that do I have the right tools? You know, just searching SharePoint, um, and you know, there's all kinds of good things that go with SharePoint. Um, but you know, just searching SharePoint, do I have the tools that I can search all of it? You know, can I search all of the SharePoints and Teams? Can I search all of my knowledge? Because knowledge isn't just documents. Can I find experts? Can I find um, data visualization models in Tableau and Power BI? Can I find uh, um, studies and surveys? Can I find you know videos easily? Can I find all of the different forms of knowledge? And so part of it is, do I even have the tools that allow all of my knowledge to be searchable? And then the other thing is just advances in technology. Um, you know, am I stuck with tools that are, you know, forcing me to ask, you know, by file name or keyword, or am I benefiting from, you know, advances in AI that allow for um, cognitive search? But with that, one of the dependencies ultimately comes down to the tagging of data. And so we have this metadata maturity model. And if we think about stage zero, which is really where most organizations are for the vast majority of their unstructured data and unstructured data being everything that's like, you know, in PowerPoint, PDF, Word, all those kind of, you know, the written word in documents. And for most documents, they're at stage zero, which is there is no tagging strategy. Um, and that causes its own issues. But as we move up the, this uh, metadata maturity model, you know, stage one is going to be document tagging. And document tagging is typically done um, through uh, human intervention. Uh, although there are certainly some systems that can automate that. But typically it's, you know, determining a finished document, checking it into a system, uh, tagging it with um, uh, with keywords or other forms of um, uh, descriptors uh, so that the document will stand out better in certain kinds of search. Um, but the next stage up where we start to get really interesting and where we really can su uh, support finding answers uh, more actively and aggressively is when we get to page tagging. Uh, so stage two is getting unique tagging to every page of content. Now, um, different than stage one, that oftentimes is done more typically by individuals that are labeling and tagging uh, at a document level, um, page uh, tagging almost has to be done at the machine level. Uh, it's, you know, for the kinds of companies we work with, where they have millions and millions of pages of content. There's no value to individuals trying to go in and tag pages, particularly when many pages will never be used again. Um, and so uh, page tagging is typically done through automation. And then the next stage of it is beyond page tagging gets into the world of custom metadata and where um, we get into highly tuned models and I'll be talking a little bit more about page tagging and Raul is going to talk to us more about uh, custom. So if the goal is how do we get to answers? And on the left side, I'm seeing an example of, you know, I made a, I've asked a question and I'm getting down to the answer. It's on page 4458 versus on the right, the more typical result. That's the long list of documents. So if we're, um, you know, if we're trying to get to that as the result, um, what does it look like when uh, we start getting into um, this stage of page level metadata tagging? And so here is that page 44. And on the right side, uh, we can see an info panel that's been opened up where there are themes, there are keywords, there are brands or organizations, and there's locations in geography. And so for us, and there's Different, um, you know, different company solutions are going to have, you know, uh, different layers to this. But when we think about, um, you know, every um, page being tagged uniquely, um, this is what we do. We get in and um, we have uh, the application of metadata that every page is different and every page has been tagged with these four um, common elements. If we go a step further on it uh, and think through it, um, you know, what are the benefits of doing this? And at one level, um, this is part of what allows the AI itself to be more accurate. You know, the evolution of AI has to understand intents and utterances in a question and then be able to pull back the right answer. And being able to have all of this metadata aids the system. Um, but one of the things, and you're seeing in this screen that's kind of cool, is that um, the metadata becomes a form of filtering that we can filter by a brand name, that we can filter by a geography, we can filter by one of these attributes. 
So if we ask a question, um, you know, what are the you know trends uh, for video streaming for Gen Z? I might get a whole, you know, uh, a great many answers, but then I can use the metadata filter and say, well, did I want to know in the US or did I want to know in the UK? Did I want to know if it's streaming? Did I want to know is it specific to Netflix or Hulu or TikTok? And all of a sudden those filters become available. And it's a little bit like shopping at Amazon for a flat screen TV. You know, you go to Amazon, you're looking for a TV and you can filter by LG or Samsung. And the reason you can do so is because there's inventory in the system that comes from those vendors. Well, in the case of um, searching giant repositories of knowledge in a company, um, the metadata effectively becomes like Samsung and LG. It exists only because in relationship to the content in the question, there is relevant uh, answers that relate to that metadata. If US shows up as a metadata term, then it's only because there is content about the US. Uh, it allows um, between a natural language search uh, and the ability to filter by things like metadata, the ability to parse through immense sets of data and get to that needle in the haystack. So one of the things that we think about on this is, uh, and we get lots of questions about, you know, how do I customize this? And so at this stage two of pay automated page level metadata, um, you know, we think about that there's the trade-off. There's a trade-off that we have in our product, a consistent model. It's automatically, it's gonna be themes, keywords, locations, and brands. And that doesn't uh, change, at least for what's out of the box. Um, the metadata is good. Is it perfect? No, but let's say it's 97 or 98% and every page has been tagged. Then the question is, that's such a leap from just document level metadata tagging, where you know there's no amount of uh, document level metadata tagging that's gonna tell you that the answer was on page 63. Um, it just can't, it's just saying this document might be relevant, but somewhere in the documents, the answer. And so we've taken an approach to say, um, if we can make that leap from, you know, broad metadata tags for a document, but now we can get to the granular level of every page, that that's a quantum leap. And for many customers, that's amazing. But there is that next layer, which is what are the things that are specific to my industry, my vertical, my company, uh, that don't fit that generic model. And I want, that's good, but I wanna go further. And so that's where we start to partner with companies like Inodata, and we can work with them and everything Raul is about to talk about can be incorporated into our uh, filtering, can be incorporated into our info panel. But we go to the level of automating at the page and Inodata goes to that next level. And so with that, uh, Raul, I'd love to hear uh, how you guys like to think about all this. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So. Um, I think one of the most important aspect of extracting metadata is, and use of metadata totally depends on what your business needs are and what your budgets are. So if you think about uh, machine learning today, it's advanced a lot in the last 10 years. And there are lots of out of box models available that can extract at a very high level, really good information or good metadata that could be good enough. So what you talked about in Lucy, where you are extracting geographies or you're extracting, um, extracting themes and you're extracting entities on a gener these models that are out of box from Amazon, from IBM Watson, from Google, they tend to be good enough for some of the use cases. And those use cases tend to be around say PR use cases, right? Or data that tends to be general news data because these models have been trained on large amount of Wikipedia data or have been trained about, trained on large amounts of uh, open source data that is available where they can extract the entities and they can extract uh, keywords, they can extract paragraphs, they can extract themes as, or geographies associated with it. Uh, but for a lot of organizations, that's not good enough because most organizations tend to have very proprietary data and that proprietary data needs proprietary models. So the next evolution tends to be, and I think you talked about in your slide and your maturity, the second thing was around document tagging. Um, and we see a lot of our clients looking for building document classifiers. And these tend to be very custom models. I'll give you a real example. We are working with a very large uh, cloud provider where they are building 
uh, where they're building an automated document classification model for um, uh, for any document which happens to be in their content management portal to be able to classify what kind of a document is it. Is that document happens to be a FP&A statement document? Is it a balance sheet document? Is it uh, it does it happen to be a, a real estate budget document, right? All of these document types, they want to automatically tag that data and then allow the users to be able to, uh, to make it easily searchable um, and aggregate those documents at that level. The, the the work required to create that kind of a document classifier at scale tends to be fairly um, fairly laborious and fairly um, extensive. So I'll take you through a journey of the, how those models get built. So the first step we, uh, we had to do was we had to first go identify and create a large amount of data set for those document types. So I didn't, because one of the biggest pain points in building a document classifier model tends to be, or any classifier model tends to be, where do you have the data? Most clients, don't have the data because either it tends to be client data which they can't use to build models so they have to rely on uh, on getting data from third party sources to create that data and that's one of the things that inner data does it has a very robust practice around data collection and data capture uh, or build synthetic data so we ended up building hundreds and thousands of documents uh, Typically, it takes 100 documents per classifier to build a model. So we we aggregated and synthetically created, which is mimicking real time, real life data for a different document type and built uh, and first collected the data. And then you have to build a model around it, which is in this case, they use the technique of building a classifier using uh, using lots of keywords that are associated with it. So in this case, we ended up helping them build lots of glossaries, which are common terms that, uh, that tend to reside within a document type. Now you could imagine building this kind of a robust 95 to 100% accurate model has taken a years and lots and lots of dollars to build that kind of a model. So that's just an example. And there are different techniques of building document classification model, but that was one technique, but it all starts with, do you have real data or do you have to augment your data with synthetic data that, that you can identify? The third way is now you've, you've built, maybe you've identified the document classification. Now you want to build, extract, extract knowledge or entities within, uh, within what's in that document. I think you talked about it at page tagging level. Now, so lots of techniques that a lot of our clients are using are building custom knowledge graph. So now one of the use cases that we are working at InnoData is being able to extract knowledge from labs data. Now, how do you, how do you know what, um, how do you extract and know whether the lab data that has been given to you and the knowledge within that lab data happens to correlate to say a nephrology use case and does it have diabetes ac21 any of those kinds of use cases so in this case techniques used you you tend to go in and you build custom knowledge graphs at a domain level that tends to become really important ingredient of building custom knowledge graphs and then the final thing that a lot of our clients say is, hey, I want to be able to extract metadata and extract a data point, which I want to be, uh, which I want to use to solve a certain business problem. So for example, um, let's take a simple example around, I want to be able to take an invoice. Like if I have lots of invoices within my use case, I want to be able to extract data points of an invoice and, and uh, automatically use, those, use that data to automate certain processes. Uh, we at Inner Data have built um, a no-code ML platform that allows us to, to run, to tag the data and be able to extract metadata along with it. But what we find is in most use cases, machine learning and AI doesn't tend to be enough to uh, automatically get, get you to the 100% answer. It tends to be a technique of using machine learning plus business rules, plus being able to uh, have human augmented intelligence, which is humans in the loop that allow you to ensure that the data that's being extracted is pristine and is usable in any manner. So lots of use cases around that, that we have solved for, and that tends to, uh, that tends to automate workflows. 
So uh, bottom line, when you're thinking about extracting metadata, think about uh, your budget, what your business needs, is, business needs are, and then think about what kind of techniques are you gonna use because building machine learning models can become expensive um, and does take time. To turn it over to audience for any questions. Yeah, thank you, Rahul. That was great. Okay. Uh, yep. Go, go ahead, Scott. Did you want to say no, something say, else? Let's dive in, on, let's dive in <laughs> on q and I think you got some good ones lined up for us, so let's hit them. All righty. Well, let, let me just start uh, with this about metadata. And uh, can, can users actually modify metadata? So uh, I think that Rahul and I are going to have different points of view on that. Um, <laughs> but, but that's actually good, because I think you want to hear the range. And so for us, and when I'm saying us with Lucy uh, and what Lucy supports out of the box, uh, we do not provide the opportunity for the user to modify it. And it's actually a conscious choice. Um, we wanna take stress out of the system. And if somebody has millions of pages of content and they feel compelled to go into that info panel and start micromanaging metadata mm -hmm. on a page, you know, one page yeah. out of a million or a handful of pages out of millions, uh, it actually creates a lot of tension and stress for the user. It's actually, from our standpoint, it's better to have a black box that they can't edit. Um, and and it does fall into that, is our automated tagging, is it good enough? Because in many cases it, it is. And actually, I really liked what Raul was saying, because there are some examples where, by the way, it isn't. And we dive into those use cases. And oftentimes I'll call Raul and say, hey, I think I've got somebody we should work on together because auto, purely automated isn't going to be good enough. But for you know the sweet spot of our audience, we don't want them to get into the micromanagement of the metadata because it's a lot of work and it actually creates a stress and tension where people feel compelled. And if they do so, it adds more work and we're trying to save people um, time and effort. Uh, Ro, what are your thoughts on that? Because you guys do all kinds of custom stuff, so there must be feedback that comes into it. Yeah, I mean, I think you can, you can, you can typically you can't change metadata on the fly, so you can't tend to create. Let's say you have, you've got an ontology and you're looking to extract metadata from those ontologies. Most use cases tend to be fixed ontologies or fixed taxonomy that you're extracting data points. You can obviously in the machine learning model, one of the most important aspect tends to be correcting the error so that the machine gets uh, improved results. So that's your continuous learning or continuous training side of it. Uh, so that obviously you can change the metadata if the machine is not giving you the right model. But being able to on the fly have a, mo a machine add another data point or another meta, um, meta field that you want to extract is very, very complicated and tends to, you tends to have, uh, tends to require new machine learning model to be created. Very cool. Uh, and I should mention, Lucy, uh, by the way, is a learning system, and she's learning dynamically based on feedback from users, and we're building custom glossary, glossaries and synonym libraries for customers, but we don't provide the editing of that metadata as an option. Well, I would think the learning piece of that would be extremely important. Otherwise, you end up with some tags that are no longer relevant. Well, so this doesn't necessarily fall into the whole metadata side of it, but it does get into uh, uh, synonyms and just even understanding things that are custom to a client. So uh, one example I like to think about is, you know, some of our customers are in the entertainment industry. And uh, I remember a customer, our user asking a question, which was about the movie Toy Story 3. And, you know, Lucy, she knows what toys are. She knows what stories are, and she knows what the number three is. But when we <laughs> hear Toy Story 3 is, is humans. We yeah. all think, hey, we know it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's Buzz Lightyear, it's Woody, it's Slinky, because we understand the concept The Toy Story 3 is an entity, it's a thing. And so we mm -hmm. had to actually train into um, the systems for entertainment customers that they under, that Lucy understands the difference between Toy Story, Toy Story 2, Toy Story 3, um, you know, movies like Avengers uh, Endgame just make a really bad sentence if you don't realize that <laughs> Avengers Endgame is actually a thing in itself. So we do yeah. uh, custom data on that sort of thing all the time. Sure, sure. Um, this is sort of a related question. Um, our content writers find that it takes 
too long to use metadata at the page topic level. How do you get around that? Yeah, so one of the keys is how much is the system demanding of the author? So if the content people are responsible for doing the tagging, if they're responsible for uploading data into the system, um, it's, a, it's a heavy lift. It's a lot of work. And while it is easy to have an Elgin interface to upload a document or to do that tagging, if you're trying to do it on pages, that's... Yeah. That's big, and you know we're working with we're working with Fortune 500 companies. I mean, it's just not worth it for their people to do that. And so our answer is automation, uh, the indexing um, of data, so that our system can uh, you know read, listen, watch, and learn. It should all be automated. Nobody should upload anything. Nobody should tag anything. The system mm -hmm. should be smart enough to be able to handle that for the user. And so our answer to the you know your content writers are finding it takes too long. Well, we automate all that stuff that takes too long so that they can just use the system and find answers they need. Rahul, did you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think um, Scott covered most of it. I think the other thing that I would add is it also depends on modalities, right? When you think about the data mm. from a content perspective, you, content could be in images, videos, audio, mm. podcasts, right? All of that. So when you start to think about the modalities of uh, extracting metadata, again, uh, it becomes uh, the, com the complexity goes up as you start yeah. to add different modalities and you need to think about that as well um, when, you, when you're looking to build custom models. Makes sense no. to me. Cool. Okay, let's see here. We've got another question for you too. What's the optimal way to combat user resistance to finding knowledge from a tool such as Lucy, um, as opposed to contacting coworkers? I think this is where you started, Scott, where you were saying that yeah. it's, that people will just start sending out at Scott, at Rahul, and so on. So yeah. how do you how do you get around that? I mean, to, to yeah, a certain extent, a... it's sort of human nature to just say, hey, does anybody know the answer to my question? Yeah, so uh, one of our frustration points uh, was that we're like, okay, we have, we've built this beautiful tool to solve the problem of I can't find anything in SharePoint. So why are there some users that aren't using it? And we've done a significant amount of surveys of knowledge workers in a variety of enterprises. And we found that people have been conditioned that they are not going to find it. The tools aren't there. The, you know, uh, none of the stuff we're talking about, the AI, the applications or tools for search, the metadata, none of it's there in companies. Mm -hmm. And so people are conditioned to not find it. So they have been trained to phone a friend ask a peer, ask a subject matter expert. And it's interesting, if you're the subject matter expert, um, we've surveyed them too. And the number one yeah. thing we hear is them saying, I want somebody to stop all the bad questions. I want somebody to stop asking the same <laughs> questions again and again. I can't get my work done because people keep asking me this stuff. So we originally designed Lucy to have this great interface and capability so you could interrogate your data and find the answers quickly. But um, there is a subset of users we encounter that are resistant. And we find that their dominant behavior is to go to Teams, Slack, Google Chat, some sort of messaging app, and just ask other people to do it for them. And so one of the things that we recently rolled out was the ability for Lucy to simply be a member of uh, Teams, mm -hmm. Slack, and these messaging apps so that when you're going and saying at Raul, at Scott, at Mary D, just add in at Lucy. And Lucy mm -hmm. will be the first one to respond in the chat back and say, I think I've got an answer for you. This is what I think it is. And if mm -hmm. you want more, see more Lucy to get to the detail in, of it, because mm -hmm. it is a hard habit to break. And so we realized yeah. if you can't beat them, join them. And that's how we've approached it. So what we really need to do is train people to ask better questions. <laughs> well, actually, what we want to do is, and we do spend a lot of time in or the organizational change management side of it, which is, how do you drive user adoption? How do you change habits? Because people have already developed the habits. I'm just going to ask somebody else. I'm not, I won't find it on my own. So why would I try? And interesting. Uh, yeah. And by, by the way, one of the tactics we'd given people along the way was that when uh, somebody, you know, sends a message to a subject matter expert, 
um, the subject matter expert should send back the result through Lucy so that they can train them to use the system more. Well, now we're going to be mm -hmm. even more efficient. The subject matter expert won't even have to see it because hopefully Lucy's already answered in, in the chat and people will hit see more Lucy and then take it on themselves. So Lucy's not only providing an answer through a messaging app, but she's also um, furthering their journey of user adoption by pushing them into the tool. When, when people do an at Lucy, do they realize this is a tool and not a person? Oh, absolutely. I mean, as much as we okay. love to personify Good. Lucy, um, <laughs> yeah, within an, organ within an organization, we're making it very clear and we've, uh, you know, many of our customers with larger deployments where they've got, you know, thousands and thousands of users have, you know, messaging uh, or communications programs sure. to create awareness and, and edify that Lucy's there to answer these questions. Yeah, yeah. Rahul, did you want to add anything? Um, no, I think um, I think Scott Scott covered it. I think organizational change management is probably the key to a lot of this. And I think mm -hmm. yeah. driving having a robust change management program for any new tool, new technology is yeah. absolutely critical for. Um, and the other thing I would add is executive sponsorship, right? Having executives mm -hmm. uh, lead the charge and showcase is really critical for adoption of any new technology. Which I suppose leads to the additional question of how do you get those people on board uh, to do those sort of promotional activities? Uh, maybe say, well, so, uh, you know, one of the things that we help customers with, and I thought you were going to ask a different question, actually. One of the things we help customers with <laughs> Sorry. is just... No, part of the, you know, part of their user adoption is communications planning and everything from how do you manage expectations to how do you promote the vision and how do you drive mm -hmm. usage? But one of the questions I saw in that one of the um, audience members had, and it's actually curious for Raul to answer it, is are people ready to trust the machine? Yeah. Is it all related to this? If we're going to, you know, if we're going to trust the interface, if we're going to go to yeah. uh, Teams or Slack and we know it's coming from uh, this AI, are people ready to trust the machine? and Raul, I'm curious for your take on that. Yeah, and I think um, uh, I think it's a journey, right? So when so when you think about AI, at the core is is a prediction engine, and the prediction engine is basically giving you a prediction score of whether it's ninety percent accurate, ninety five percent accurate, ninety seven percent accurate, ninety nine percent accurate. That kind of <laughs> prediction score. I think depending on the use case. You need to set up your thresholds. What's acceptable to one to accept a machine's answer versus not not answer. So when you're thinking thinking about a diagnosis in a radiology X-ray, you can't have something which is 97% accurate because that's not good enough. You need 99% accuracy, and you need humans to probably validate it. But mm -hmm. if you're looking at say a use case which tends to be say a sentiment analysis on a news article. That might be good enough, right? A positive or new because it's not life threatening. So I think, the, and I might accept a 75 or 80 percent accurate sentiment score around that. So I think, depending on what your use case is, the humans in the loop becomes more and more critical or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, uh, I, was, uh, I was wanting to hear your answer on that one just because, you know, for the audience that doesn't know you. You know, you've been in from the pioneering days of this stuff uh, yeah. back at IBM all the way through. So uh, you've been an architect and, and lead on this all the way through it. Yeah, it's just been a really interesting journey around it. And uh, it's interesting to see how the world has uh, transitioned. Yes. Indeed. <clears throat> okay, we've got one more question here. Uh, Scott, this one is definitely for you. Can Lucy respond to audio requests or is it only written inquiries? Yeah, so the um, so through the desktop, uh, we just have people at the keyboard and type the questions. But one of the things that has been a byproduct of our integrating Lucy into the conversation through uh, Teams and Slack is that all of a sudden Lucy is mobile. You know, she's on iOS, she's on mm -hmm. uh, Android, and more importantly, she's on an app that many corporate users have already installed and use. I mean, it's hard to get people to download mm -hmm. a new app. It's harder 
to get yeah. them to change habits and use apps that aren't already part of their routine. But thankfully, Slack and Teams from so many people already um, uh, are part of the routine. They're already on their devices. And one of the things that's native to those OSs is that anything you can type, you can ask uh, via audio. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'll pick up my phone, I'll pull up Teams, uh, I'll hit the microphone and I'll ask away. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, this is all the time we have for questions today. And we do apologize that we were unable to get to all your questions. But as I stated earlier, they will all be answered via email. So I would like to thank our speakers today. Uh, Scott Littman, founder and managing partner, Lucy. Rahul Singhal, Chief Product and Marketing Officer, InnoData. If you would like to review this event or send it to a colleague, please use the same URL that you used for today's event. It will be archived for 90 days. Plus, you will receive an email with the URL to view the webinar once the archive is posted. If you would like a PDF of the deck, go to the handout section once the archive is live. And just for participating in today's event, you could win this $100 Amazon card. The winner will be announced on August 31st. We will reach out via email if you are selected as this month's winner. Thank you again for joining us.